welcome back. This will be the last episode in our series of Chad According to Chad. I know, I know you're all thinking, oh no, what are we going to do without Chad's experiences, insights, and gifts to guide us? Yeah, well, all good things must come to an end, and bad ones too. And bad is probably the operative word here. Bad writing, bad choices, bad outcomes. And speaking of bad, Chad's autobiography, our primary source, Living on the Edge of Heaven, that book, wrapped up as of May of 2017, with Chad saying nothing about his new side hustle as a guest NDE speaker for preparing the people. Instead, he concludes his autobiography like an acceptance speech for a Pulitzer Prize. It's sort of like he's answering fan questions. What's next for you, Chad? What makes you so a great author, Chad? Chad brags that he can write 10 pages in two or three hours because for him, writing is just like watching a snippet of a movie and typing it in until another scene comes to his mind. If you've been keeping up with this series, you'll know why no one in the entire free world who's watched even a few movies between 1980 and 2010 will be surprised that writing is like watching a movie for Chad Daybell. Harry Potter, Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, 2012, Independence Day, Twister. That's just to name a few. So up until now, the source materials we've been relying on have been mostly Chad's 2015 blog and his 2017 autobiography, Living on the Edge of Heaven. And then also a few newspaper articles he wrote during his brief career as a journalist. So if you're, if you're familiar with Chad's writing or speeches, you might have noticed that Chad likes to use the word glimpses or glimpse. He glimpses a lot, glimpses into other dimensions, glimpses beyond the veil, claims he has his own glimpse of the first vision. That's Joseph Smith. He glimpses into the Oval Office and lots of other glimpses that he can't tell us about. Secret glimpses. Chad is like a spiritual peeping Tom. Who knows? He might even be glimpsing right now. Hi, Chad. Chad, Chad himself says his autobiography was a glimpse into his life. But to glimpse into Chad's Rexburg, Idaho life, his real life, starting around about 2018, our sources are going to change. Well, go from the writing that Chad wanted people to read to material that Chad never thought would see the light of day. I'm talking about texts, emails, and phone calls that were made public in Lori Vallow's trial. I've covered those in quite a few episodes. All you have to do is go to my YouTube homepage and do a search on texts and you'll find them. They're, they're pretty shocking. Even though I try to interject a little humor here and there, when you get a glimpse, as Chad would say, a glimpse of the very different private Chad, he really comes across as a dangerous man. A lying, meddling, fear-mongering creep with an oversexed teenager vibe. And this man could turn around in a microsecond and start tossing around religious references to Jesus and heaven like candy. And then he can go back to fear-mongering and explaining about how all the sinful people in America are going to be zapped, but all of his followers are going to be the good guys. All saved so they can create and live in a loving, perfect society led by 
none other than Chad. Oh, uh, speaking of good guys, I have to say I did learn something useful from Chad's last novel. It's called Reclaiming Liberty. It's a little secret Chad shares and may just revolutionize forensic science as we know it. So stay tuned to the end. But for now, let's get into it one last time. Chad, according to Chad, part six. Hello again, and thanks for joining us. For those of you who have been here before, welcome back. And for those who are new, my name is Catherine, and I'm a mom of four grown children, a yaya, which is Greek for grandma, a registered nurse, and I love exploring the country of Greece because that's where my family's from, and I have been researching and going and visiting Greece. So that's me in a little nutshell. And over four years ago, I started this YouTube channel called Left Undone Incomplete Investigations. It was one of the first channels that covered the story of the two missing children from Idaho, seven-year-old J.J. Vallow and 16-year-old Tylee Ryan. If you really want a deep dive on this case, I also have a podcast that goes into a lot of detail, Afterglow, Unveiling the Idaho Cult. And it starts from the beginning of Lori's life and goes on. It will be updated soon, but there's three seasons on there that you can binge for real. So um, thank you to the new subscribers here and also to the new subscribers on my Greek travel channel, Beyond the Empty Nest. I appreciate it so much. It's so great you're discovering the beautiful videos I have of Greece over there. I look forward to chatting with you and answering any questions if I can. If you haven't watched parts one through five of Chad According to Chad, I suggest you go back and start from the beginning. We've covered a lot of ground and you might be pretty lost if you try to start following Chad's timeline from here. But no rules, you can if you'd like. So on to episode six. The whole point of this series was to examine Chad Daybell's life through his own writing before his trial starts to determine what kind of person he's been through the years. It also has been an exploration of the prosecution's theory that Chad Daybell participated in the deaths of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and his own wife, Tammy Daybell motivated by the desire for money, power, and sex. Last episode, we looked at the money aspect with the working theory that after bankruptcy humiliated Chad in 2008, he got a chip on his shoulder and wanted to prove to the world that he could be financially successful. Something else we didn't talk too much about was that by 2009, he was the only one of the four Daybell brothers who didn't have some sort of postgraduate training. In 2009, Chad, who considered himself the smartest, most studious Daybell brother, his words, wound up the least educated and the least financially successful. So somewhere in his screwed up mind, he's trying to figure out how to deal with financial humiliation. Circumstances lining up to bust his phony visionary claims. The possibility that the world sees him as the least successful Daybell. His protege, Julie Rowe, making money hand over fist as a speaker. These are just a few of the reasons why money became super important to Chad. And to think about it, all of this was happening to Chad in his 40s. He's 47 when he moves to Rexburg. The bloom is definitely off the rose, as they say. And Chad is headed for a midlife crisis like like no other. 
So as far as money being a motive for Chad's behavior in the days leading up to the crime, money was a motive to lie, to make up two near-death experiences that did not happen. I'm convinced. After last week's episode, some people might have been wondering what happened to Chad's friendship with Julie Rowe. Well, the short answer is he dumped her. Remember Chad's 2015 blog, the one that lasted a month? Six days into that blog, August 21st, 2015, his golden goose, Julie Rowe, had her first book banned by the LDS church education system. A Greater Tomorrow was put on the list of serious materials. Of course, that was a huge deal. This list is something circulated to the LDS high school seminaries, colleges, and institutes of religion. If a book is on the list, it means the church thinks you are a fraud. So obviously, Chad had a decision to make. Spring Creek had published a book that his church said was a bunch of baloney, B-O-L-O-G-N-A, baloney. Chad had to think hard about what he was going to do. And you know, no doubt, this was a job for The Voice. The Voice. The Voice. The Voice. Hey, do you guys think The Voice is going to show up for Chad's trial? Sorry, Chad. The voice, the voice. I'm sorry, Judge. I heard voice, some voices in the corner the and I, I, it distracted me. I apologize. Sorry, John. The voice, the voice, the voice, the voice. You know, I kind of hope so. I'm planning on attending the trial and there are a few things I'd like to say to that voice for real. Come on, voice. Let's meet out in the hall. I've got a couple things I want to say to you. Leave a comment if you want me to ask the voice anything when I'm at the trial in Boise. So in August of 2015, apparently it told the voice, it told him to stick with Julie and ride her scandal with all its free publicity all the way to the bank. So Chad doubles down on his own blog and talks about how great Julie is. And then Chad encourages Julie to publish another book on more visions. On March 1st, 2016, Chad Daybell publishes Julie Rose, From Tragedy to Destiny, A Vision of America's Future. So some of you might be saying, well, that's business, freedom of the press. He had the right to make money. And fair enough, all that is actually true. Remember though, by 2016, Chad knows Julie is mentally ill. Her family has already come forward and begged for public compassion and help when she started acting strange. Julie went off her meds. This is public knowledge. She's getting in trouble. She doesn't need someone to exploit her. She really just needed help. But Chad, he went with the money-making choice. Plus the opportunity choice. Julie Rowe and their shared AVAL connections at that time were opening doors for Chad to become a speaker. Based on the outrageous admission prices for her talks and things like $125 online psychic healing sessions, there were ways to make money. And she opened Chad's eyes to more opportunities to gain money and fame and more book sales. So there's a point to this story, this crazy, terrible story, where you have to ask yourself, did these visionaries actually believe these ideas they were selling? Did Chad truly believe in Julie? Was there any sincerity there? Did he really believe that Julie was a prophet? Well, his next actions suggest the answer is probably no. 
Rumors hit Rexburg in early 2019 that Julie was going to be disfellowshipped, you know, kicked out of the LDS church. Julie's edgy reputation, I think it's fair to call it an edgy reputation, was fine for book sales. But when he heard that she was going to be kicked out of the church for apostasy, false beliefs, Chad dropped her like a hot potato. Here's a text that Chad sent to Zulima Pastinus after Zulima asked if she could go to a Julie Rowe conference. She was asked to be a helper. Monday, March 4th, 2019 at 8.30 a.m. Chad to Zulema. I wouldn't go. I don't think any of our group is planning on going. Is this high school or what? Like he's Gretchen from Mean Girls. Chad continues. Something isn't quite right with Julie right now. I would avoid talking to Keith too. He's her spy. Julie is very curious about my involvement with the Arizona girls, but I haven't told her anything about you, Melanie, or Lori. She feels she has the right to control anyone she associates with, but you women have separate missions from hers. Anyway, hopefully by May, you'll be doing much more amazing missions than helping at Julie's event. Julie was disfellowshipped one month later. So it's hard not to see Chad's character from this. He's taken advantage of a mentally ill woman when she suited his needs, to use his words from the grocery store article. But also, he turns his back on her and backstabs her the minute she's a liability. Don't want to say too much more about Julie Rowe, but if you want to check it out for yourself, what Julie is up to now, she has a website. I'm not recommending it or putting it down. I'm just giving you the information. It's W-A-S-A-T-C-H-Wakeup.com. It's on the screen. You do you, Julie. So as I said, when Chad ends his autobiography with a summary, there's nothing about his NDE speaking career. But there is a very brief passage about what a great fit Rexburg, Idaho is for his whole family. With a strong emphasis on how Chad predicted it correctly via The Voice. The Voice said the move was going to be a tremendous blessing to all of his children and grandchildren. Can't help but notice that The Voice failed to mention any sort of tremendous blessing blessing for Tammy. Here's Chad's synopsis of the Rexburg years, June 2015 to May 2017. It has all the predictable Chad elements we've come to recognize by now. Chad is always right. Chad's kids are all on track. Oh, and by the way, the earthquake I predicted that never happened is still going to destroy America as we know it, but we can all be fine with it since I'm super special and can fix things in a way that nobody else can. And then Chad throws in some more visions about Springville, of course, that um, he didn't tell anybody about at the time. And Chad has to say, Tammy is smiling all the time now. What is this thing Chad has about 24-7 smiling? Listen to what he wrote on Ava when she died. Moving into the second half of my life. My dear wife, Tammy, passed away in her sleep early Saturday, October 19th, when I awoke around 6 a.m. It was clear she had been gone for several hours. It came as a shock. I couldn't believe I hadn't been awakened somehow, but all indications are that her spirit simply slipped away during the night. Her face looked serene, with her eyes closed and a slight smile. It was devastating to discover her that way, but I'm so grateful that her death was peaceful. T 
Tammy really was the anchor of our family and our publishing business. We have worked side by side from the moment we were married in the Monte Temple in 1990. It is safe to say I never would have become an author without her faith in me and her constant encouragement. Tammy herself wasn't a visionary woman, but she believed what I told her and trusted my decisions. And what we know now. Like, seriously, what we know now. He's going to trial for her murder. And he wrote that. Smile, peaceful, oh la la. That's not a nice guy in any way. And he wraps everything up with himself, all toned and buff, visiting the Springvale Cemetery as an exalted being. Well, uh, we talked about that too, right? But what we didn't talk about was the other people in the Springville Cemetery he saw. Chad saw a lot of dead relatives and friends, including Tammy, all dressed in white, coming towards him saying, we did it. Should I say it? It's almost too easy. Okay, I will. Get yourself a hearing aid, Chad. Were they really saying, we did it? Are you sure they weren't saying, he did it? I know for sure if that happens, there are going to be a lot of angelic voices saying things you don't want to hear, Chad. But I guess we'll see what Chad has to say for himself at trial, though. Innocent until proven guilty, right? I would like to see him actually speak like Lori did at her sentencing. I want him to get on the stand. I would love to hear what his dumbass has to say for, I'm just a nice guy and I got suckered into this crazy woman who, you know, uh, you know, I was just, I was just sinful and I was just attracted to a beautiful woman and I know it was wrong and then they took advantage of me and now I'm, now my wife's dead and I didn't want that to happen. And they faked me out and they they put bodies in my backyard so I would take the fall. But me, I'm just Chad. I'm just Chad. I'm just Chad. Like, really, seriously. Like, I'm just nice guy Chad. Anyway. Little tangent. Little tangent, sorry. So anyway, the last few pages of Chad's autobiography were definitely spun up to emphasize Chad's glory to set himself up to write a lucrative NDE. But as far as writing went, he didn't actually write that much in Rexburg after 2017. Despite how Chad bragged, that he could write 10 pages in two hours, one page every 12 minutes. Between May 22, 2017, and the day he was arrested on June 9, 2020, that's three years and one month, he wrote 158 pages total. And for someone who writes five pages in an hour, if you do the math, that's what, about 10 hours of writing a year? So what's he up to, really? There's an excerpt from a talk he gave at a Preparing a People conference describing one Rexburg activity he enjoyed. I have a good group of friends in Rexburg that are like the head of the IT department, head of the food and services department, and we just have little lunches together. And we... We tell each other what's going on up there. I'm, I'm a lucky guest. I just get to listen to them. Uh, they like to tell me stuff, so it's fine. Uh, but there's so much going on there that it's just not a rumor that that's where the headquarters of the church will be. It's a fact, and it's it's marvelous to see how it's coming together. Um, 
But I want you to not just believe my words. Each one of you has a special mission and you need to pray and find out. And I know that the Lord will tell you, going back to where I started as a 14 year old, you don't need to have a vision to know what you're gonna do. You just need to have the Holy Ghost testify to you of what you are meant to do and as a part of this great work. And this sounds a lot like how I picture Chad as a missionary telling people what's going on in his head, getting free food, gossiping a lot, acting like a know-it-all. Hey, Chad's not an obscure little niche author anymore. He's hanging around with more important people now. The BYU food service and IT managers. Wow. The guys who handle the necessities of life, his life anyway, free food and free Wi-Fi. Remember when Chad said he was obsessed with the Billy Joel song, Only the Good Die Young? Chad reminds me of another Billy Joel song. Chad has always wanted to be a big shot. Big shot. So this is a good segue to talk about the prosecution's theory that Chad could be motivated by a desire for power. Did Chad crave power? Short answer, yes. Yes. And yes. Did he ever? You heard Chad say in that clip that Rexburg was going to be the headquarters of the church. It will happen. He's talking about what will happen when Salt Lake City is destroyed by this huge earthquake he keeps predicting. Now, let's get one thing straight. Utah has major earthquakes. Earthquakes happen in Utah all the time. They have been happening for centuries. And there will be more earthquakes in Utah. Saying someday there will be another big earthquake in Utah, it's not visionary, it's science. Basic science. He's got a great opening line for people right there in Rexburg. He'll look them right in the eye and tell them how blessed they are, how special they are, the circumstances of their life that brought them to Rexburg for a big, important reason. He'll say, let me do my Chad voice here. You are already on the scene of the new Jerusalem. God brought you here. Now, all you have to do is follow me, read my books, pay an extra five bucks on Aval, pay to attend some overpriced preparing to people talks, and I'll keep you on the right track. I'll give you the inside scoop on your mission. You know, nothing would make Chad happier than an earthquake wiping out Salt Lake City and Temple Square because any sort of natural disaster would give him celebrity, even today. With credibility comes power, and Chad has learned that. There was a Salt Lake City earthquake in March of 2020. Thankfully, no one was killed. But there were actually Chad followers who tried to say it was connected to his visions, that he had guessed its Richter scale value accurately or something. But Come on, that's ridiculous. Chad is a fraud. His prediction was a guess based on averages, and that is it. Chad is a con man. That is how con men work. They will use anything they can to make people believe that they are legitimate. And that's what he's done for years. You know, how is having power lunches with the BYU food service manager, a guy whose job it is to make sure the cafeteria doesn't run out of frozen french fries? How relevant is this to Chad's mission? More Chad logic. More Chad crapola. Seriously, I'm sure the food service manager at BYU Idaho is great. Not putting him down. He does a hell of a lot more than buy frozen french fries. My point is that Chad is not infiltrating the inner sanctum of the New Jerusalem. He's a con man. The truth why he's 
up at BYU, Idaho every day? How about it's yet another Chad Daybell fancy spiritual excuse for being a 50-year-old creep who's hanging around a college campus every day watching young students walk by, reliving those days that 23-year-old Chad wrote about, prowling the aisles of grocery stores, fantasizing about girls. That's a lot more likely. Chad's on the fast track to being a big preparing a people speaker on the way to filling the Rexburg Tabernacle, 3,000 seats. So let's talk a little bit more about power, this time on the home front. We've talked a lot about Chad's behavior and the money motive. Now let's look at the power issues and power plays at home and with the people he got close to. Chad's writing has shown us One, has to be right all the time. The voice is always right, which means Chad is always right. As someone like that, someone who has an I know more than you do about things you can't comprehend attitude, when a person like that has authority, it's going to be a problem for every single person beneath them. If you question them, you will be told you're wrong. If you push an issue, you'll be shamed. You'll be degraded. Told you're not in their league. Shunned. In Chad's words, he thinks, and this is a quote, he has been blessed with great knowledge, but 99% of the people he knows do not realize that. Chad. Two, uses fear to control. Chad made up visions to create an ideology that instilled fear in people so he could control them. Fear of floods, fear of earthquakes, fear of famine, fear of disease, fear of dark spirits, fear of his own version of boogeymen making others fear people who point out his flaws or even more egregious to him those who could expose him for the liar and the cheat and the fraud he is fear of missing out and underneath it all he placed anxious minds a fear of missing out the second coming was going to happen soon and in a specific place. And everyone had to be ready to serve God in Chad's specific way. It was horrific what Chad did with the power he gained. He laundered the apocalypse and a bunch of stupid disaster movies into a series of ridiculous books that ended up being propaganda tools for his ideologies. And propaganda is the right word. Propaganda is using written materials, images, speeches to abuse power. It is one of the most perverse forms of gaslighting. Shoving a vision of something in someone's face so many times and insisting it's true until eventually they feel it's true as well. His hack writing created fear and worry. You can see it in a lot of his texts to Zulema. Here's one. Thursday, June 6, 2019 at 8.25 p.m. Chad to Zulema. I'll work on you. I got attacked earlier and the 18 got out today. June 6, 2019 at 8.27 p.m. Zulema to Chad. Oh my, I am in pain. Friday, June 7th, 2019 at 4.34 a.m. Chad to Zulema. It was Lucifer himself, I am told, but he is now 
banished from Arizona. So sorry. I mean, I honest to God, when I first read that Chad banished Lucifer from Arizona, I about fell over and couldn't get back up. Like, what in the heck? Chad banished Lucifer from Arizona. So freaking stupid. <laughs> stupid. Oh, my God. So then Friday, June 7th, 2019 at 7.41 a.m. is a lemon to Chad. Oh my goodness, no wonder I was hurting so bad. I woke up with a really bad headache. It hurts to move. I wonder if he put weapons in my head. This this cruel game, it went on for months. Thursday, August 8th, 2019, Chad to Zalema. I cast out the demons that were afflicting you and removed the weapons, negative cords, and curses. I also healed the damage they caused. I am sorry, you are being attacked. Don't doubt yourself. The attack was coordinated by Lucifer himself. You are a valiant warrior that he wants to discourage. So, Chad, he had this messed up, gullible woman believing that Lucifer was after her. But most concerning is his lack of concern for her mental and physical health. June 6, 2019, at 8.22 p.m. Salema to Chad. Is someone attacking me right now? I feel like I have a hatchet in the middle of my chest. Zalema feels like she has a hatchet in the middle of her chest. Instead of doing what any responsible, caring friend would do, i.e., tell her to call 911, you might be having a heart attack, go seek medical help, I don't know. Instead of encouraging her to do that, to seek medical help, he tells her she's being attacked by dark spirits. So making people afraid is a huge power play. Make no mistake, Chad, he enjoys power. Chad, great, quits jobs and creates financial chaos. Another kind of fear Chad instilled was on the home front. The way Chad kept quitting jobs had elements of power and control too, particularly when his children were young. It felt like Chad pulled the rug out from underneath Tammy and his kids financially, almost at whim. Chad put a lot of, I'm going to call it spiritual guilt, in the air when he wanted to quit a job and be a writer again for a little while. Anyone who blocked his great destiny, the Lord's mission for him, watch out. You're against the Lord's will when you cross what Chad wants to do. Finally, Tammy took some control and just worked full time. Chad, number four, gaslights. Obviously, there is a tremendous amount of gaslighting in all of this and especially with the voice. Gaslighting is loosely defined as manipulating someone into questioning their own perception of reality. We've seen countless examples of Chad browbeating Tammy till she heard it too, until she bought into his reality. A reality that surely been proven by now was a con game. Chad. Number five. Shifts blame. Remember how Chad, according to Chad, how he wrote that Tammy blamed herself for the 2008 bankruptcy? And I said, I could totally see how Chad was behind that. Why did I say that? It's because over and over in Chad's writing, we've seen that Chad doesn't take responsibility when things go wrong. When he's lazy, when he's not good at something, when he blows it. Sometimes he takes a tiny bit of responsibility, but always in a phony way, with false humility. Another power play he uses. His, I'm just a humble prophet and every choice I make is guided by God. That's an act. There's nothing humble about this guy at all. But he's learned that by acting the part, 
just at the right time, people back off. If Chad says God is guiding him, who are they to question it? So his lies and selfishness have gone on for years. This phony, humble prophet routine. He's a con man. Don't know how many times I can say that. Chad, Daybell is a con man. The closest he'll get to admitting fault is, yeah, well, I did X, but only because of Y. Well, I did this, but because of so-and-so said, or this person did, or whatever, or whatever, this circumstance. That's the closest he'll ever get to admitting anything. That's his fault. You know, 99% of the time, Y being some mystical reason that includes how special he is. I shared a list of all of Chad's power and control issues, how he has to be right all the time, uses fear to control, creates financial chaos, gaslights, shifts blame. These are elements of coercive control. Maybe not a textbook case, but so much of Chad's behavior points to mental cruelty. And Chad, he was free to get away with it. Because he put a big religious bow on top and called it prophecy. 